Good evening. This is Jacob Hornberger, and this is my weekly show here on the internet. I'm president of the Future of Freedom Foundation at FFF.org. Nice to be back with you. You know, I hate to uh, be, and I told you so, but <laughs> I told you that the Republicans would cave. Didn't I say that? I mean, I've been saying it for a long time now. Uh, on the debt ceiling um, controversy, I told you they would cave in, despite all their big talk about, you know, going the distance this time. I mean, we all knew they were going to cave. I mean, it, it's just it, all they're huffing and puffing. That's all it is, is just huffing and puffing. And, and President Obama knew they would cave. That's why he said, I'm not going to negotiate one bit of government spending reductions. I'm going to continue spending out the gazoo. And, and he knew that the Republicans would cave. That's why he took that position. When you know somebody's going to cave, why give in at all? And we all knew that they were going to cave despite their op-eds and their grandiose statements about how they favor a balanced budget amendment and how they want to rein in federal spending. Here was their opportunity. I mean, here you, the government is spending more than a trillion dollars. I think it's $1.3 trillion more than what they're bringing in. And, and the status, led by President Obama, are there saying, spend more, borrow more. Just keep going into deeper and deeper debt. Don't pay attention to what's happening in Greece. Don't pay attention to what's happening in these states and cities in the America that have gone bankrupt. Oh, yeah, they were overextended. Yeah, they were under mountains of debt, but that's different. We've got to just keep spending our way into prosperity, borrowing our way into prosperity. It is absolute financial and economic idiocy in its purest form. But that's our position. That's what the state is saying. Continue spending, continue borrowing. Notice, as I repeatedly pointed out, you know, as long ago as two years when the last debt ceiling debate was going on, I said, if you raise the debt ceiling here, which enables the government to continue piling on more debt on the backs of the American people, because that's, that's where it lands. The government's incurring it, but ultimately American taxpayers are responsible for paying it back. That the Democrats are not going to cut spending at all. And, and so you would think, logically, that last time when the Republicans said, okay, we will let you borrow some more. We will raise the amount of debt that the federal government's permitted to, to accumulate. But what happens after that? They just laugh. The status mainstream press laughs because they know they've scared and, you know, uh, bamboozled the Republicans into increasing the amount of debt that can be incurred. And they don't cut spending at all. And, and even when they see that the new debt ceiling, the maximum amount of debt that the federal government can accumulate is on the horizon, they just laugh because they bring up all the chicken little stuff and the Mayan calendar stuff that, oh, the world will fall, oh, there will be a default, and oh my gosh, plunging into a new recession, and they do this every time. I mean, it's really kind of humorous because they do it every time. We all knew they're going to do it every time, and the Republicans play their little game of, well, this time we're not going to fall for it. But they always do fall for it. I mean, you know, and so they always cave. But here was their opportunity to rein in federal spending. You, you know, you you all if you don't raise this debt ceiling, what that means is the government cannot pile any more debt onto the debt that they've already saddled the American taxpayers with. That that debt ceiling has been reached. No more new debt. So that means that they got to live off their tax revenues. Uh, I think that's around two trillion dollars. Okay, well their total budgets or total amount they're spending is around three point five or something like that. Well, in other words, they got to cut out immediately one point three trillion dollars of excess spending. That is the amount in excess of the tax revenues that are coming in. It's a perfect way to rein in federal spending. It's a perfect way to achieve a balanced budget. Isn't that what Republicans say they favor? I mean, how long have they said, oh, we favor a balanced budget amendment? Well, here you don't need a balanced budget amendment. You just don't raise the debt ceiling. And the government's got to slash $1.3 trillion in spending and live off of the tax revenues. Now, Obama and the state have said, oh, there'll be a, a breach in the payments. You know, the debt payments, the government will be able to pay its debts. Well, you know, all that is a matter of how do they allocate the tax revenues that are coming in. I mean, they've got to get rid of $1.3 trillion in spending. And uh, so you decide, well, what are you going to do with the, you know, the $2 trillion or so that you're coming in with tax revenues? Are you going to pay 
the debt. You're going to pay the Social Security recipients. You're going to pay the, the military empire. You're going to pay the, the foreign aid to dictators. Uh, Got to make a decision, but isn't that what any family does? Isn't that what these bankrupt cities and states do? They say, okay, we got to slash spending one way or the other. We got to live within our means. Uh, well, that's not what they did. I, I mean, if that calls for a default, uh, you know, where they say, well, no, we're going to get, we're going to prioritize the money to go to foreign dictators, you know, or foreign aid to dictatorship program. Okay. And they, they don't have enough left over to pay their debt payments. Well, that's a choice they've made. But notice what they're saying and what they've just done with the complicity of, of the Republicans. They say, we're already deeply in debt, more debt than should be, than is, than is allowed. And they say, the solution to this is to raise the debt ceiling and borrow more money in order to make so that we don't violate the conditions of our bond payments, our debt indebtedness. What? I mean, what they're saying is we have to have more debt in order to pay off the current debt. That's just crazy. I mean, imagine that you, your family's deeply in hock. You know, you owe the bank a million dollars and you're, you're bringing in a hundred thousand dollars and you say, well, the solution to this is, oh, and you're spending, you know, like uh, Three hundred thousand dollars more than your hundred thousand dollar income, and and uh, your solution, if you're a statist, is oh, well, I think I'll just go out and borrow more money. So now instead of owing the bank a, tr a million dollars, I'll owe the bank a million point one, and I'll use that extra hundred thousand to pay off my debts and to pay off you know my my you know new Porsche and st so forth. So at the end of this process, you now owe the bank $1.1 trillion instead of a million, uh, $1.1 million instead of a million dollars. It's crazy, but that's what they've done. When really, as a, as a family, if you find yourself deeply in debt, the best solution is to slash your spending. I mean, even if that makes sacrifice, means making sacrifices, you know, you don't go to the movies, you don't go on vacation, you don't buy any new clothes for a while, no new cars for a while, no, you know, you, you slash the spending so that your income exceeds your expenditures and then you use that excess to start paying down that debt. You don't go out and say, well, I'll just get a new credit card and I'll have, oh, one million plus another hundred thousand in order to keep everybody happy. Because if you do that down the line, you're going to do it again. You're going to do it again. I mean, it's like an alcohol, an alcoholic, you know, giving him more booze. And that's what it is with these, these people in Congress and the president. All they want to do is spend, spend, spend. And here was the perfect opportunity to rein in federal spending. I mean, the perfect opportunity to balance the budget. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible. So what the Republicans did, they agreed to punt the thing for, um, you know, three months. So they raised the debt ceiling for three months. Well, what's that going to accomplish? I mean, you know, three months from now, you're still back at the same boat, except you've got more debt piled onto the American people. And, and okay, let me give you my prediction, because I'm going to tell you that, that uh, you know, three months from now, I'm going to be, and I told you so again. Three months from now, the Republicans will cave again. Okay? I mean, if they cave this time, if they couldn't stand fast and say, you know, enough's enough. We're going to rein in federal spending right now. We're going to rein in $1.3 trillion. We're going to make them live under a balanced budget. Taxes equal expenditures. you got to slash. You decide where you want to slash, but you got to slash $1.3 trillion. And uh, they're not, they didn't do it this time. Why would they do it next time? And so what they're hoping is, is that President Obama gives them a fig leaf, you know, that, that, that um, enables them, let's say he revises Social Security payments and, and uh, you know, in some minor way or Medicare payments in some minor way. Then they can say, oh, wow, we have, we extracted this concession from President Obama and now we can raise the debt ceiling again. And that's what they're hoping for. And, and President Obama might give them to him, you know, just to make them you know, have a little fig leaf to hide, you know, what, what they've done. Um, I don't know. Uh, this time he said no. You know, he knew they would cave. They, he knew they were bluffing. And so he said, I don't need to give it all. I'm going to spend and spend and spend and borrow and borrow and borrow. I don't care how much the debt keeps going up. It doesn't matter. This is the way to prosperity. This is we can spend ourselves rich. And 
And of course, you know, the Republicans, uh, remember when they used to brag about how they brought down the Soviet Union uh, by making it spend its way into bankruptcy? You know, Ronald Reagan started, you know, competing in the arms race and military spending against the Soviets. And so they were both, you know, spending, 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 but the Soviet Union had less of an economic base than the United States, and they spent themselves into bankruptcy. Uh, well, notice that Republicans never talk like that anymore. They never remind people. They just say, Ronald Reagan brought down the Soviet Empire. But they don't say how he supposedly did this. Why? Because they're now doing the same thing that the Soviet Empire was doing. They're spending out the gazoo. They're spending this nation into bankruptcy. Make no mistake. That's where they're headed, this nation. Uh, they're spending their way into bankruptcy. And three months from now, it's going to be no different from what it is now, except for the fact that more debt has been piled on the American people. But the expenditures will be going on. President Obama is not going to be slashing spending. Neither are the Republicans. And, uh, I mean, this is where we are. I mean, this is what the welfare warfare state has brought us. And, and, and you know, that's why at the Future of Freedom Foundation, we continue talking in terms of, not just the minor stuff, you know, how to rein in spending and so forth. I mean, yeah, that's important. But it's much more important to challenge the whole apparatus of the welfare warfare state. You know, where, where, you, where you, you get rid of the welfare warfare state and you end up with limited government, a limited government constitutional republic, but one that doesn't have a welfare state apparatus attached to it and a warfare state apparatus attached to it. Because it's our view that these are just cancerous apparatuses. Uh, you know, they, they, they just, they're just they they're killing uh, American society, not just financially, economically, but morally and spiritually. Uh, I mean, look at the welfare state. Well, how do they justify this thing? Oh, well, they say, well, people will starve in the streets if there's not a welfare state. You know, they'll, they'll just be dying. That, that the elderly, that they, they just will, you know, might as well just, you know, send them in the suicide chambers, you know. Um, it's, it's ridiculous. Uh, I mean, you know, America live without Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid and farm subsidies and SBA loans and aid to dictatorships. I mean, for more than a hundred and some odd years. And and people got along fine. There wasn't anybody starving to death or, or dying of, of, of um, you know, inability to get health care and so forth. I mean, we, we had the finest health care system in the world once before Medicare and Medicaid, and before occupational licensure. Uh, and, and the states have just destroyed that. And, 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 of course, it's the process of interventionism. They All their crises, including soaring health care costs that are a direct result of Medicare and Medicaid, they then use that as the excuse for more and more interventions. And so what we've got to do is just challenge this notion that people would be dying in the streets without the welfare state. Uh, you know, another... Um, justification they use is this sh this shows that Americans are good people. It's ridiculous. This is a system founded on force. How can force and goodness be reconciled with each other? If you don't pay your payroll taxes, um, and, 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 you know what do they do? They they put you in jail. They they seize your assets. They seize your home. That's force. And then they sell it in a foreclosure sale. And, and if you resist, you're going to find yourself in the hereafter because they will use deadly force if you use deadly force to resist. Uh, I mean, this whole system is based on force. Forcibly taking money from one group of people and giving it to another group of people. How can that be reconciled with goodness or charity? Charity is something you do. You write a check on your own. You help out your parents, you know, they're suffering from cancer. They're, they, they've gone broke in their later years. You go in there and you help them out. That's what family values are all about. That's what charity is all about. That's what our ancestors understood. And then these statists converted our whole system based on charity into one based on force. And, and yet you cannot find anything like that in the Bible, the Old Testament, the New Testament. Uh, you know, this notion of using force to, to make people good and caring and responsible. And it, it, it's really the height of immorality. It's the height of, of evil, if you will. I mean, imagine me going to you and holding a gun to your head and saying, go help out that poor person over there. My gosh, I mean, we can all see how horrible that is. Um, and, uh, well, to do it collectively through the state, uh, it's not only not showing how people are good and caring, it's the exact opposite. 
And, and so what we've got to do is challenge these, these premises of the welfare state so that we don't just balance the budget and so forth. We get rid of the welfare state apparatus. I mean, we get rid of these programs. And, we, and, and that entails, you know, belief in ourselves that we can do this, that the free market does work, that the free society does work, that people will help out others. It takes that conviction. And especially, you know, when they all of a sudden have a 30 percent increase in, in raises because you don't have to pay the income tax anymore. No more Social Security tax, payroll tax. You get to keep everything you earn because there's no more welfare state for the money to be taken from one person and given it to another. And, of course, the, the other side of this is the warfare state. And, 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 and you all know that they, they justify this by saying, oh. Well, uh, if we didn't have a warfare state, you know, the standing army, the military industrial complex, thousands, no, hundreds of bases overseas, uh, or a thousand bases in more than a hundred countries, and, and the CIA and the NSA, if we didn't have this whole warfare state national security apparatus, why we would wonder. That, that, that the, the communists would take us over, the terrorists would take us over, the, the drug dealers would be running Congress, the illegal aliens would take over the presidency, uh, you know, the terrorists would be, you know, running the interstate highway system and putting toll booths up, and it is absolutely inane. There is no chance, none, that any of these groups of people, much less some foreign nation is going to invade the United States, conquer America, occupy America, and take over the Congress and the presidents and the judiciary and so forth. It's all these catastrophic thoughts that they put in people's minds because then they see then if they convince people that that their security and their safety depends on the national security state, well then people say, oh gosh, we got to have big government. No, we don't have a choice. And we saw this all during the Cold War. When the Republicans said, okay, we concede that the whole national security state apparatus, the CIA, the military industrial complex, the whole vast military establishment, the Pentagon, and so forth, that it's big government. This is gigantic big government, but we have to have it in terms of facing the communist threat. And if only we didn't have a communist threat, conservatives said, then we would favor the dismantling of the big government. Well, we libertarians said, that's bull. Republicans love, conservatives love big government. They just don't want to admit it. Uh, deep down, we said, look, even if the communist threat were to end, Republicans would still favor big government. And the Republican boy, conservatives would get all upset with that. No, that's just not true. That's not true. We favor big government only because of the communist threat. Well, what happened when the Cold War ended? <laughs> conservatives were among the first ones that said we've got to maintain the big empire here. Uh, to protect us from the communists that, who still could come back. Because for a long time after the end of the Cold War, the Berlin Wall had come down, the Soviet troops had exited Eastern Europe. There were, there were some conservatives who were arguing that this was all a ruse, that, that the communists were doing it as a ruse to have us uh, lay down our guard so that they could then come and conquer and invade us. It was so ludicrous. And, and so they said, oh, that there's a chance the communists could come back. And then there's communist China and there's Vietnam and, and they could, the, China, the communists could come and invade America. We need big government. And then, of course, all that big government started provoking people in the Middle East after the end of the Cold War and, um, and doing all sorts of horrific things there, which results in all these terrorist counterstrikes, the USS Cole, the embassies in Kenya and Tanzania. Uh, the 1993 attack on the World Trade Center, 9-11, and so forth. And so all of a sudden, now we've got the new official enemy, uh, not communism anymore, sometimes communism, and then, but now the big one's terrorism, and, you know, behind the terrorists are the drug dealers and the illegal aliens. And anything to justify this huge national security state. And the idea is that it's that that's keeping us safe. It's sort of like the welfare state. That without the welfare state, everybody starved to death. Well, without the warfare state, everybody would be, you know, under the chains of the communists and the terrorists and the illegal aliens, drug dealers, and so forth. That's the myth we have to burst. Because you see, once people start to realize that this is a bunch of bull, then all of a sudden they sit there and say, "Well, what do we need a welfare state for then? What do we need a warfare state for? What do we need this huge national security apparatus for?" Um, you know, I read this fantastic book over the weekend. I mean, it is an absolutely mind-blower of a book. I mean, I, I just couldn't stop reading it. I, I, 
I was so shocked. I was so stunned. I mean, you know, it, does, it takes a lot to shock me. You know, I mean, I've you know, studied this whole statist paradigm for a long time. And, you know, nothing they do surprises me. Well, I shouldn't say nothing. Sometimes they do something that I still find shocking. But this book was a mind blower. Um, it's called Kill Anything That Moves uh, by Nick Terse. And it's about the Vietnam War. Now, if you read this book, if Americans read this book, they will, you will never see the Vietnam War in the same way again. I mean, whenever, you know, they bring up this notion, oh, we were fighting the communists, and okay, we lost the war, but by golly, our intentions were good. We were over there helping the communists, helping the South Vietnamese, uh, you know, uh, resist communist tyranny, and, and, and America was standing hard against the communist threat, and the dominoes were going to fall, and you, know? you read this book, and you will absolutely be astounded, shocked. I mean, shocked is really the, 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 the word shell shock. That what the book is about is the whole entire system there. The invasion, the U.S. invasion of Vietnam, the occupation of Vietnam, during the, all those years was just one gigantic series of daily war crimes that, that were being countenanced by the Pentagon, by all the higher-ups. I mean, it's just incredible. I mean, okay, don't we all think that, you know, the, the My Lai massacre, you know, where William Cowley was, you know, the, the, he and his men, you know, massacred, I don't know, 500 defenseless women and children, just start shooting them. No guns. They didn't have any guns. Or he just started shooting these people. And and we've all been taught that that's sort of the, you know, sticks out uh, as the aberration, as, as the thing that was just different. And that we were over there, you know, carefully targeting the, the enemy and so forth. Man, Terse has pierced this thing. It is the most incredible thing. And he's got it all documented. I mean, it, it, I was shocked because on my Kindle, I had reached about 60% reading. I said, okay, I still got 40% or something like that. And all of a sudden, I'm, I'm at the epilogue. And I said, well, how is this possible? I still got another 40% or so. Well, it turns out that 40% or 35% or something is all his documentation, the footnotes, uh, so carefully footnote that what he did, he started looking at court martial records. He went over to Vietnam and interviewed people there, especially in sites where people had been massacred. He interviewed troops that were involved in massacres. And what he found out was that My Lai was just the tip of the iceberg, that it was just normal, that My Lai was a normality that that was standard operating procedure throughout the war. And he documents it all with details, with testimony from, from soldiers where they'd go into villages and just massacre the villagers. Uh, and, and just, even though they didn't have any, any guns on them, they just massacred them. And rapes, I mean, it, it's incredible. I mean, you and worse, worse than rapes. And, and I, I don't want to go into that in this show, but you read what some of the troops did and, 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 it's, it's just shocking. It is absolutely shocking. You know, teenage girls, uh, defenseless people throwing grenades into their deals. That what would happen is the Viet Cong would, would ambush American troops um, and, uh, that, you know, near these villages and so forth, and then skedaddle. They wouldn't stick around for a head-on fight, you know, because they knew they'd lose against this overwhelming military power. Well, the troops who had just lost, you know, their best friend, a Marine or something, would just go ape. And they'd go into the village and, and get retribution and just start shooting everybody. And this was going on like on a daily basis. And, and, and it was all guided by body counts, you know, that, uh, and, and the way that the, the, um, the higher ups would cover their own you know, rear ends on this thing is they had the formal rules of engagement that said, you know, you will not kill civilians and you will not kill uh, defenseless people. Um, and so that, that way they could say, well, we're not responsible. We, we have the rules of engagement here. They're all in writing. But then they demanded these body counts, and the pressure was on the troops all the way at the bottom. Bring in the body count. Bring in the body count. That was all that matters, just body count. Well, Turs goes into all these records and finds that they've killed all these people, you know, like 500 people at this location, and they, and, and they do a weapons count, too. It would be like 10 weapons. And so Terse is like saying, wait a minute, something's not right here. And, and he determined through you know, the interviews and court martial records and stuff that they would shoot. Their, their orders were to shoot anything that moves. And that's the title of the book. 
So if a person was running, let's say a farmer was out in the rice paddies and he saw a helicopter gunship coming and he started running, that would authorize the helicopter gunship to shoot him because guilty people don't run. Well, this is crazy because people would naturally run. They may not be familiar with that principle. Uh, and they would they knew that helicopter gunships shot people. And so they'd run for their lives and they'd get shot. And, and this applied to kids too. I mean, like I tell you, this thing is a page turner. Every single page, you're just sitting there practically numb. Like, oh my gosh. It, I mean, this, this book... It deserves to be read by every single American because this is what the national security state was doing in Vietnam. It was massacring mass numbers of people, extremely large numbers of people. And, and you know, thinking that this was going to win the war, when it, as Nurse, as Terse points out, the more people they killed in these villages, the more the ranks of the Viet Cong grew. I mean, they were killing people's brother and sister and father and son, and they'd laugh about it. They'd make jokes about it, and they'd say, hey, let's target that guy, and, and they'd do target practice. And it, the horrific stories of torture. I mean, you think torture started after 9-11? Oh, oh, my gosh. Well, of course, there's Operation Phoenix that he goes into, but it was standard fare. And there was an early rendition program that if the U.S. was a little concerned about you know, some torture, they turned the guy over to the South Vietnamese or to the South Koreans, who were brutal. They had no compunctions about torturing people. Um, and and so whenever somebody complained, because some of the troops came home and started complaining about what they had done and what they had done, what they had seen and what they had done, and uh, the higher ups would oh say oh okay we need to check into this and they have an investigation or they'd have a court martial. I mean that's where some of the records that tourists found are. But then they'd acquit the guys or they would dismiss the charges or they'd give them a light sentence. I mean even Cali, he ended up I don't know spending. Some ridiculously low amount in 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 jail, um, so that that's what the whole thing is: is that we will protect you. We got your back. Is what the higher ups were doing, and uh, then they had a huge massacre in an entire sector after the Tet Offensive, and uh, the military knew they were in trouble on this. There was a guy writing for Newsweek that had done extensive investigations and had determined what had happened here. Just a massacre of large numbers of civilians and uh, intentional and the military knew they had a problem at this time so the higher ups the Pentagon and so forth they said well we'll just drag this out with a series of investigations and sure enough that's all they did they had one investigation after another after another after another nobody ever be brought up on war crimes charges and and of course it, 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 it makes the Yamashita doctrine a total joke uh, you'll recall that General Yamashita, or Admiral Yamashita, I can't remember which one it is, a Japanese general who uh, was held responsible for the same thing as men were doing, torture, raping, uh, pillaging, you know, all, all sorts of horrific war crimes. And Yamashita w did not even countenance, I mean, he disapproved it, he ordered him not to do it, and uh, they executed Yamashita, the U.S. did, after the war, and the Supreme Court upheld it, and uh, so, you know, that's exactly what should have happened here from Westmoreland on down. Uh, at least a trial of these guys, uh, but nothing. And um, so if you put things in context, you know where the national security state comes into existence in 47 under the so-called communist threat, and you got the, the overthrow of the Mossadegh regime, and then the, you know Guatemala, the assassination attempts on Castro. You got Kennedy that it, you know, sees the light after the Cuban Missile Crisis and goes to war against the national security state, you know, threatens to uh, tear the CIA into a thousand pieces and so forth. And then Johnson gets in and you know, uses you know, the opportunity to start sending troops into Vietnam. And then these horrific massacres, I mean, in violation of every principle of legality, international law, morality. I mean, it's just sickening. And then you've got the support of the Pinochet regime that was torturing and killing and incarcerating people without trial. You know, 40,000 people or so with the full support of the military. you got the CIA and the military participating in the execution of that young American journalist there in Chile, Charles Horman. What I'm saying is, is that this is not a good thing. And that's what, of course, I'm writing in my series right now in, in the Future of Freedom, our journal. Uh, at FFF is it's the evil of the national security state that you can't have a free society you can't have a moral society a spiritual society 
uh, an economically prosperous society with this cancer in our midst. This is not our heritage. Our heritage is not a huge standing military establishment. It is not a secret police force. It is not all this spying and, 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 and monitoring people and so forth. It is the antithesis of all this. And that's what we do as libertarians. So we got to challenge the welfare state. We got to challenge the warfare state. We got to challenge the the jugular veins, you know, that that fund this thing, the income tax, the Federal Reserve system, and and then we start talking about you know what a free society is all about because that's the only way to achieve a free society, not by modifying or reforming the welfare warfare state, but by dismantling this cancerous part of the the government by getting rid of it. And then, then we move forward into prosperity and harmony with the people of the world, natural harmonies. And, and um, that's the key. That's, that's the key to our future as a nation. And then we, we lead ourselves out of this morass of statism, and, and we indirectly lead the world, who will be marveling at what we're able to accomplish here in America through the achievement of a free society. That's the show. Thanks so much for listening in, and I'll uh, see you next week.